G'day, I'm Paul. The last Volkswagen Touareg was a personal favourite of mine. On the outside, it was like a family SUV, but beneath the skin, it could harbour like this big six pack in the form of a W12 engine. And this new generation Touareg shares a platform with the Audi Q7, the Bentley Bentayga, the Porsche Cayenne, and the Lamborghini Urus. So it can't be too bad, right? So today we're going to do a detailed review of this. This is the 190 Premium. It starts at just under $90,000 but this one here has almost $30,000 of options on it. So we want to figure out whether this is good value for money and whether you should be sticking it on your family SUV list. If you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review, you can use the time codes up on the screen there. Or if you're on YouTube, just scroll down to the description where you'll see the links. And if you haven't done so already, I would absolutely love it if you could hit subscribe and also press the bell icon so you'll find out every single time we drive a Lamborghini Urus in disguise. Let's talk exterior. I think the Touareg looks really good. And by the way, is it Touareg, Touareg? I don't know, remember I'm Australian, so I'll probably pronounce everything wrong. It's always had a bit of a muscular look to it and they've retained that. It, it's got that stance on the road. You know that it's a premium SUV and you know that it's coming at you. This one here has the R-Line package fitted. You can see, cause it says R-Line. It gets the front and rear R-Line treatment. It's about an $8,000 extra to add on to this. And keep in mind that while we talk about this car, some of the stuff that you see fitted to here is going to be optional. I'll call out as much of it as I can, but make sure if you do buy one of these, you just double check to see what is standard. Big proud Volkswagen logo there and that big imposing grille with all the chrome highlights. Six colors available, all but the base white is an extra $2,000. I love how colors just become more expensive the bigger the car is. What I find weird though, have a look at this. There's these holes that I thought initially were for a camera or something, but there's just a screw in there. And there's another one on this side as well. So it's just a random placement of things. Very strange. Um, full LED headlights. This one has the matrix LED lights as well. So it will see around other cars and dip the beam as traffic approaches you. And I love on the inside there, there's like alligator teeth just in front of the light. If we jump around to the side here, you'll see 20 inch alloy wheels, 285 mil wide tires, air suspension. And they're a pretty cool design. They don't look too fancy. They're not too big. They just look nice and elegant and I'm keen to see how this rides because with air suspension and 45 profile tyres this should be nice and cushy and I hope Volkswagen's managed to retain that in this body given that it is shared with a number of performance SUVs. Come around to the side more R-line badges indicator built into the wing mirror get these nice looking roof rails, chrome highlights around the side, privacy glass fitted to this car as well. Then around the back, I think this is probably my favorite angle of this car. It kind of retains the design of the previous generation, but it gives you the addition here of LED lights. Just looks really good, especially at nighttime. If you're following this car, you're going to know exactly what it is. And it has that nice low slung stance on the road. Welcome to the inside of the Touareg. Have a look at this. This is one of the biggest interior flexes I've seen since, I don't know, I reckon the Tesla Model S when it had that 17 inch screen. This is cool. That's a 15 inch screen. And then ahead of the driver is almost a 13 inch screen. I'm going to go into a lot more detail about this new infotainment system soon, but on first glance, this is a really nice looking interior. Now, motoring journalists all harp on about soft touch plastics. So we got a device here to test out our soft touch plastics. This is called a durometer. It's a hardness tester. Measures on a scale from zero to 100, where zero is super soft, 100 is super hard. Let's see what that dashboard is like. That's pretty impressive. That's in the 50s there. What about this center console lid? Yeah, nice. That's not too bad as well pretty impressive. But what about the build quality? Hmm. Well, while I was driving over here, I heard some creaks and rattles and I was like, I wonder what that is. And then I started poking around. Have a listen to that. That sounds terrible. So while you drive, all the thumps kind of make that flex and then the sun makes it flex as well. So it is pretty disappointing that this has been built like this. And then the other thing I noticed the bottom of this screen sits flush with the screen adjacent to it, but this part up here sticks out. It's only by like three or four millimeters, but there is a clear difference there. So I don't know, this doesn't feel as premium as something like a Bentayga or a Q7. Yes, I understand it is cheaper, but I don't really get it. The Touareg's built in Slovakia. They all share the same platform. Why can this be built like this and the others aren't? Okay, let's talk infotainment. And what we're going to do is split this detailed infotainment review into three sections. First, we're gonna look at the 15 inch screen over here. 
the screen ahead of the driver and then the heads up display. So let's kick off with this screen. It's called Discover Premium. This is now on the Tuareg. It is an option, so it's part of the $8,000 option package. The standard screen's much smaller and has the buttons integrated beneath it. They don't really look that good. It has gesture control, as you've just seen. Using your hand, you can swipe between menus. Sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, so who knows what's going on there. This is the main screen. You can see it's divided into three sections. You have your navigation map on one side, telephone, and then FM. Let's jump through navigation first. This is a really high resolution screen. It's a super fast processor as well, so you can zoom in and out very easily. And then I love the fact that you have an auto zoom mode here as well. What that means is that as you approach intersections or you're on a highway, it's going to zoom in and out respectively so that you don't constantly have to keep fiddling with it if you don't necessarily need to see the streets that are coming ahead. And then check this feature out, rocket mode. No idea what that's for, but it has rocket mode. <laughs> What about entering a destination? So you'll notice there as your finger gets close to the screen, it's got a proximity sensor on it. So right now it's empty. As the finger approaches, it brings up extra context menus that allows you to go to a new destination. So let's just try Melbourne Airport. We'll see how quickly that finds it. It's actually going really fast. There we go, we've got the airport there. That's really quick and you can see in the background it's processing and giving you more options as it goes as well. So navigation, big tick there. What about phone connectivity? Apple CarPlay and Android Auto is standard, but both of them require a cable. They're not a wireless system. I'll show you what that looks like. Despite the fact you have a 15 inch screen, that's all you get for CarPlay. I would have thought they would take up that entire screen and really just give it a detailed, sophisticated look. So it is a bit disappointing that it is shoebox into that little slot just there. Over on the radio menu, you would expect to find AM, FM, DAB Plus online streaming. Unfortunately, you're only getting AM and FM radio. There's no DAB Plus digital radio, which seems entirely bizarre when this car that we're sitting in has every single option pack available and you still don't get it. You do get a voice recognition system though. So a push of this button allows you to call contacts, enter navigation addresses, and it works really well. You can also use that button to interact with your CarPlay or smartphone mirroring system, which is far more accurate and will get the information across through the cloud. Now, when you do disconnect your phone from CarPlay, it will then connect over Bluetooth. Using Bluetooth, you're able to stream music, make telephone calls. So I'll show you what the phone menu looks like. Here you can add favorites. You can see your recent calls, contacts, and also manually dial numbers. One more push of this button takes you to the second home screen. This gives you a bit more detail. You've got a clock up there. You can switch between two different styles. Vehicle status, so if the car has any errors, it will tell you what's going on. It'll tell you what state the tires are in. And finally, oil level. Positioning, so I often say this, you're probably never ever going to need to use this, but if you are involved in an accident or you're first to arrive on an accident scene, it's very, very relevant that you know where to find your global position. You'll be able to give this to authorities so they can come and find you. And then here, it also tells you how many satellites you're currently connected to. Let's have a closer look at the other menus you have along the top here. So your media menu allows you to stream over Bluetooth audio, the inbuilt SD card slots, or the internal jukebox, which is internal drive storage. And if we jump over to car, if you do any off-roading, the off-road menu will tell you your inclination, the tilt angle that you're on, and what the all-wheel drive system's doing. You can change the different modes here. So when you are in off-road mode, you're presented with more information. And that's gonna be handy if you ever go to the bush or you're going to a favorite camping site all of that information is contained within this screen. You can then deep dive further into the available menus for the car with convenience consumers. So what is consuming energy inside the car? The driving data, so how much fuel you've been consuming over the long term, short term, you can reset that as you go. And finally, the vehicle status. So any errors that appear here, you'll be able to find them such as tire pressure, oil pressure, the whole works is going to appear on that center screen there. The other fascinating thing is the animations they've been able to integrate here. So with the seat heaters, they come up nicely there. You can switch those on and off. And then when it comes time to adjusting your climate, check this out. So it gives you an overlay of the car. It allows you to set climate through the different zones, including an eco mode where it only heats part of the cabin that you're in. So because I'm the only one in the car at the moment, you can see it's only heating the driver's cabin. And if you then press this, it shows you what's happening in the rear of the car. You've got four zones of climate, so you can change those as you please in the Touareg. And this screen allows you to visualize everything as you go. Heated steering wheel button is here as well with three different heat settings. The last thing I wanna show you here are the cameras. The car is loaded with cameras and normally we complain when it comes to 360 cameras that they don't present a high enough resolution screen. Well, different story with the Touareg. Have a look at that. You can see very clearly there. And then I love this 
press 3D, and then it allows you to skip around the car and find different views. And it literally looks like there's a little drone above the car controlling everything. And then you can manually come in and move things around yourself if you want. And then you also have the Park Assist Plus, which allows you to go in perpendicular, parallel, in and out of parks. It has you fully covered if you're not overly confident with parking. Last thing I wanna show you here as well is this. You can configure the car to back up to a trailer properly so that you're not going to ding the car as you're reversing. Then you also have a super wide angle camera if you're reversing out of a spot where you can't see cars coming either way. Moving on from the 15 inch screen to the 12.3 inch screen ahead of the driver, this is another pretty impressive flex as well because it is incredibly high resolution and it seems quicker than the screens they use in Audis. I'll quickly walk you through what this is able to do and how to operate it. So right now we have it in map mode with the dials on either side, tachometer on the left, speedometer to the right. One push of a button changes that into a full map screen. Look how quickly that transitions. You can see the speed in that processor. There's really no lag there at all. Then using this button on the steering wheel, we can switch between different displays. So I can have audio on the screen and the station that we're listening to, telephone and anyone that I need to call. Vehicle status, so this is important if the car has any problems, this is where they're going to appear. You can see we've got a door open there, so it's telling us on the screen. And again, in any of these menus, you can switch between small and big screen. Head up display, you can switch it on and off. Off-road menu, if you are going off-road, you can get the same display that you have here with the inclination and the angles that you're on. Driving data, so again, trip computer data is all stored in here and then you can move between the different screens that are available to you. You can configure all the assist systems on the go, so you can switch those on and off as required. Come through here if you don't want the side assist on, you just give that one click and then it switches off. And finally, we're back to the map menu. What you'll find here is that this map menu is extremely handy if you don't really know where you're going. It'll zoom in close enough so you can see the street that are coming up and if you are looking for anything in particular you can zoom in a little further just using the steering wheel controls and finally ahead of the driver we have the heads up display shows you the radar and how far you are compared to other cars we've got a speedometer there as well and if you have any navigation data that's going to appear ahead of the driver too and again just on and off here it's all very straightforward Let's talk other features. So remember I said earlier that this car has virtually every single option ticked on it. So if you are buying one, just make sure you double check the options that are standard with the car. I'll run through what is fitted to this car. So heated and cooled seats, four zone climate control, low and high speed autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian detection. And this has quite an innovative feature when it comes to pulling out of side streets. If you do pull out and don't see a car coming across the other way, it's able to detect that car and stop before you hit it. That also works in reverse as well with rear cross traffic alert. So it's all standard. Panoramic glass sunroof adds a fair bit of light to the cabin. Like I mentioned before, this screen is optional. The standard one is smaller. You also just get traditional gauges in front of the driver and instead of the full display. Um, heads up display, optional as well. DIN Audio sound system, you have an LED lighting package. You have 30 colors to choose from. So they light up beautifully at night. You can set the intensity and the shades that you want to be displayed inside the cabin. It's also a massage function on the seat, 18 way power adjustment, memory for the seats, electric steering adjustment, and the R-Line package adds this pretty neat looking wheel with R-Line down the bottom. Now, what does the key look like? Let's fish that out. This is the new generation of Volkswagen key. So there's the front of it, lock, unlock and boot. Then if you flick it around, there's the Volkswagen symbol. This is the old Volkswagen symbol. There's a new symbol coming on the new Golf. So this will be replaced soon. It's a proximity key. So you just keep that in your pocket and then grab the door handle to open the door. Then once you're inside the car, it's a push button start. Moving on to practicality, what's the storage like? Let's grab our phone, that fits virtually anywhere and there is a wireless phone charger down here. So you tuck your phone in there, lights up to say that it's charging. What about bottle storage? Well, two cup holders up the front here and they have these retractable grips on them. So you can fit pretty big bottles or small bottles or small coffee. And then inside the door, you have generous door bins with bottle holders and then room either side. Center console. Not massive, not overly small either with one USB port. Your other USB port is here. There's also this little cubby hole here. There's netting down the side here for bits and pieces. And then the glove box has storage for your manual. Although there's not a great deal room in there for anything else. You then have SD and SIM card for remote connected services in there too. What about comfort? Yeah, these seats are nice. So they have the inbuilt massage function and the R-Line gets the R-Line treatment there and that faux 
carbon weave up the top. It's a really nice place to be seated. I do like that this is an R-spec steering wheel, but I think it looks a tiny bit cheap. I don't know, this is the kind of thing you'd expect fitted to cheaper versions of Volkswagens. I would have thought the Touareg has a thicker, meatier steering wheel, especially in the R-line trim. Let's talk second row. As a grown adult, I can fit beautifully here. I've got loads of knee room, heaps of toe room as well. And it's just a really nice accommodating space. If someone was sitting here, I wouldn't feel too close to them. I think you'd probably even be able to fit three abreast at a pinch. There's also a center armrest with three cup holders, but let's see if they fit. So yes, no, no. So it's like a normal bottle, small bottle, and then like a piccolo cup or something like that. You can also put this in the door. And you know what's interesting? Right down the bottom of the door, this has like plush pile carpet at the bottom. It's, it's going to be impossible for you to see, but you just have to trust me that it is really nice and soft inside the door bin. Map pockets in the back of the seats, and then this is where you control your four zones of climate. So up and down with the temperature, you then have heated seats for the outboard seats. And check this out. You get two USB outlets plus a 12 volts. Then if you've got kids in the back, two ISOFIX anchorage points on the outside seats. And then the ability to move yourself forwards and backwards. And there's also a recline function too. There is one more feature I want to point out. You remember the old school method of having to do the child lock on a car? You had to get the key, put it in the back door while the car was stationary, and then your kids wouldn't be able to run out by pulling the handle. Well, these days, it's far more advanced. On the driver's door, there are two buttons. One push of it will stop the window going down and also lock this door from being opened on the inside so the kids won't be able to escape or get themselves into trouble accidentally. And just on kids, here's something for them to break. <laughs> A retractable blind. One of the advantages of not having to have seven seats is that you get more boot space. So crack this open, power tailgate. And by the way, you've got an auto close function. So with the key in your pocket, you push that button, you can walk away and the car will close and then lock on its own. 810 litres of cargo space in here, which is really impressive for an SUV that is under five metres long. We've got a little carpet there, which is nice. And then under the floor, you have the space saver spare tire. Now this one's interesting. If you have a look at this, it's got like a, a gap in the middle there. It's quite thin. The way this works is you pull it out and you hook it up to that compressor. The tire expands and then it pops into position. It's quite daunting to see this in action because it just bursts into place all of a sudden. That's where they're going to save even more space in the boots of cars with space saver spares. Under here as well, you have the big subwoofer for the optional sound system fitted to this car. And then the car's battery is over there as well. I love this feature too. So if this is too high for you and you know, if you're loading in bigger bits of luggage or shopping or something like that, it can be with the air suspension. Push and hold this and it will drop the car by 40 millimetres, which means getting things in and out is far easier. You can see it lowering there on the air springs, it's reached position. And then the retractable cargo blind closes on its own with the door. So you never need to touch this. That is a really cool feature. Okay, let's drop these seats, pull of that, pull of that. They also go flat. I'll show you how that works quickly. They just lock into position there. And once they are down, that expands the space to 1,800 litres. I'll pop our bag in there just so you can get a reference for how big this is. There it is there. You get a 12 volt outlet here as well. And then also a couple of lights on either side. We've hit the road in the Touareg and let's talk engines to start with. The one under the bonnet of this car is an interesting one. It's shared with the Volkswagen Amarok. The Amarok is the dual cab ute that Volkswagen sells in Australia and other markets around the world. It's a really trusty three litre turbocharged V6 diesel, makes 190 kilowatts of power, 600 newton metres of torque, but it's not quite the engine that's sold in Europe with this car. You're getting more torque, more power, and it's just a much better driving experience. We're lumped with quite an old engine, unfortunately. There is a V8 diesel coming to the Touareg range, but for the moment, you're just gonna have to stick with this one. That torque is all sent through an eight speed automatic transmission. For the most part, it does a pretty good job of handling the 600 Newton meters, but you can catch it napping at times. So here's an example, I'm just gonna roll onto the throttle. You kind of have to wait for stuff to happen. And while you do get that big surge of torque when it is ready, there is quite a lag there. And I just wish it was a little bit more responsive in gear. 
In terms of fuel economy, 7.4 litres of fuel per 100 kilometres is the official average. We've been averaging around 9.7, so it's close enough to that figure. If you do just get the standard Touareg, you get a 75 litre fuel tank that gives you just over 1,000 kilometres of driving range. But with the sound and comfort package, you get a 90 litre fuel tank, which means you're getting well in excess of 1,000 litres per tank of fuel. 0 to 100 kilometres an hour is dispatched in 6.5 seconds, and this is what that looks like. You have a litany of drive modes to choose from, so by pushing this button here it presents everything that's available. So we have Eco, Comfort, Normal, Sport, Individual, Off-Road and Snow. Individual of course is the mode where you can select the characteristics of the car, so if you want it to be firm but don't want it to be sporty you can set that up or vice versa. What I will do is slot this into Sport and see what that feels like. Okay, so that has instantly become a whole lot firmer. You can see that platform sharing has kicked into action here because this feels a whole lot more like a KN than it does a Touareg. Let's pile it into this corner and see how it handles. Yeah, that is really impressive. It's sitting dead flat through there and it just feels so nice and hunkered down to the ground. The steering's become a whole lot heavier. It just feels really capable. Well, you're gonna get tired of that sport mode pretty quickly. I'll just drop that back into comfort. Now the comfort's interesting because the air suspension really levels the ride out. It has adaptive dampers in there as well. So it does feel nice and smooth, but I don't know, it's weird. You, f you hit some potholes, some bumps, and some other sort of weird bits of road, and then it can get quite brittle. It's really hard to explain. It's not soft and cushy like a Q7 is. It feels like they've tried to engineer a tiny bit of sportiness in there as part of this R-Line package. If you do need to do some towing, this will support 3,500 kilograms of braked towing capacity, and that's about right for a car this size. Q7 with a slightly more powerful engine does the same, so this won't be as capable as the bigger Q7, but it is capable enough to tow something like a caravan or perhaps a camper trailer. Let's talk off-roading. So you get 213 millimetres of ground clearance, but if you do put it into the off-road mode, and also you can adjust it manually, the car will lift by 70 millimetres. So that means you can do some decent off-roading without clipping the under tray. In the off-road mode as well, it adjusts stability controls and the amount of torque that's being sent to each wheel. It also dulls the throttle response a little bit so that it is more capable and less edgy over rocks and other rough terrain. And then of course, the suspension works in sport mode as well by lowering the ride by 15 millimetres. Let's talk visibility. So it's not as big as something like a CX-9 or a Volvo XC90, but I have good visibility out the front. The wing mirrors are big enough and then they have the blind spot monitor built into them. Visibility out the back isn't the best. I was expecting a little bit more and that's partly due to this mirror being quite thin and then the window at the back being quite thin as well. But outside of that, it is quite easy to maneuver and easy to park as well, especially with, again, I'm using that word, optional park assist plus that's fitted to this car. Now, regularly the turning circle is 12.2 metres, but fitted to this car is a four-wheel steering system. So I'll go full lock here, and it turns like it's on a dime. That is unbelievable. So that feature will be really good if you're doing a lot of city driving or if you're in narrow car parks. Basically inverts the wheels, it allows it to tuck in nicely. And then in sport mode, you get the benefit of effectively reducing the wheelbase of the car. Okay, what is cabin noise like? It is pretty damn serene in here. Even on course chip roads, it's dead silent. You really don't hear anything as you drive along. It wafts along nicely. The diesel engine is quite quiet as well. And then it has that nice thrum when you do step on it. Now, in terms of stepping on it, oh, once it does finally wind up, you get a mountain of torque just punched into your back. That 600 Newton meters really works well with this car. It weighs around 2,000 kilograms, so it's not that heavy. In fact, it's a little lighter than an Amarok. So that means that you are getting really sprightly feel behind the wheel. So I said at the start of the video, I've always been a Volkswagen Touareg, Tuareg kind of guy, and I think I still am. It's an SUV that has luxury inside it. And to me, this is just a cut price Lambo. I know, different engine and all that sort of stuff, but it shows you what the platform's capable of, which means the way they've packaged it works really well. It is let down though by some very cheap stuff inside. I just don't know how this feels so different to something like a Q7 in terms of build quality. 
just feels a little bit let down by that. The ride could be slightly better as well, and I think it's time to ditch that V6 diesel. Leave that for the Amarok. There is a V8 diesel coming to Australia, so that's going to appeal if you do need to do some towing. I think it's got almost like a thousand Newton meters of torque. So this is a really good car. Be careful of options pricing, but outside of that, you should go have a test drive if you need a luxury SUV. Let us know in the comments below. Did you buy one? Are you looking at one? What else have you cross shop with this? It's kind of in a weird segment on its own there. And if you haven't done so already, I'd love it if you could hit subscribe for our channel. Press like on the video if you've enjoyed it and also press the bell icon so you can get notified every single time we publish a new review. But until next time, drive safely.